Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 14th session of the IAC CAFRAD seminar series. Today's seminar will be held in English. Our speaker of the day is Mr. Sunil Tawani from India, who is an author, a speaker, a board member, and a fellow of the American Society for Quality, and also the CEO of Quality Indeed Consulting Limited in the UAE. Mr. Tawani will be speaking to us about building resilient public institutions in, in uncertain times using management systems approach. Today's session will be moderated by Mr. Najib Bensouda, whom I will briefly introduce. Mr. Bensouda was born in Gambia and raised between Africa and Europe. He earned his MBA from the Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University in the USA. He has had a successful career specializing in the hospitality industry for over 30 years, in which he has opened and managed hotels for international chains in an array of destinations on the African continent and in the Arab world, ranging from established tourist destinations to more challenging contexts. This extensive international experience has allowed Mr. Bensouda to develop a holistic and inclusive approach to management, which he continues to employ and refine in his professional endeavors today. Mr. Bensouda is furthermore multilingual, mastering English, Arabic, French, and Wolof. Now I will highlight some housekeeping. Everyone except the speaker will be muted by default during the session to avoid disruptions. You can choose to have your personal camera on or off. It would be appreciated if you could display your own name. The talk will last about 30 minutes, after which there will be a moderated Q&A session. At this point, you can ask questions or make comments either by writing in the chat or raising your hand. The session will be recorded and will be published on the IAC CAFRAD Seminar Series YouTube channel. Now, without further ado, I will pass the word to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. I would like to welcome you to the 14th session of the IAC CAFRAD Seminar series. My name, as, I, as uh, the management uh, said, is Najib Bensouda, and I am honored to have been asked to moderate this very important conference, which comes at an opportune time. Unfortunately, we have been set in our ways for the, for the last decades, doing things, thinking that we are developing, thinking that we are pushing ahead and never stopping one minute to think, to re-strategize, to think of, hey, maybe we're doing something wrong. We didn't think so. We just pushed along and just went straight ahead like a bull in a china shop. And like the bull, unfortunately, we didn't realize that we were doing a lot of damages. Like, uh, of course, the, the environment, you know, polluting rivers, polluting oceans, cutting trees, and so on. And uh, we didn't realize that. We just kept bulldozing and going ahead. And unfortunately, until we got a, a, a really rude awakening, and the rude awakening, as we all know, is COVID-19. This came as a shock and came all of a sudden. And as we were not prepared, we, you know, we just didn't know what to do, where to begin. Even the governments themselves started sending us contradictory messages, contradictory information, contradictory uh, telling us what to do, what not to do the next day and so on, and even confusing us more and more. So we were, I, I believe at that time, what we can say is that we were doing, the governments and us and everybody else was doing trial and error. And when does trial and error happen? It's when we are unprepared, when we are very unprepared. We were unprepared, we didn't expect this, so we just started, let's try this, it doesn't work, let's try something else, it doesn't work or it works. And we kept going on like this. So we were completely caught off guard. This is why our topic today is timely and is of vital importance. 
and we are honored to have Mr. Sunil Tawani as speaker. I'm going to read Sunil's uh, credentials because uh, I don't want to, uh, you know, leave anything out. The gentleman has deserved what you know, all the credentials he has. He has been uh, very, very involved in many things and he has done many, many consulting. So I will read it. Mr. Sunil is a leading management professional with over 35 years experience in TQM, business excellence, corporate governance, strategy service excellence in diverse industries, such as government, seaports, logistics, oil and gas, manufacturing, services, banking, education, healthcare, etc. He has contributed as a consultant to UNIDO, to the Nigeria Quality Infrastructure Project. He was also invited by the International Trade Center Joint Agency for the, two, for the WTO and the United Nations to share his experience with African nations on creating successful and sustainable quality associations. Um, so as we can see, Mr. Sunil has a lot of experience dealing in Africa and with African authorities. I can go on and on and on with his credentials but that will be that won't be fair because I'll be taking time from his conference. So without further ado, I will let Mr. Sunil take over and share his valuable experience with us and tell us how building resilient public institutions using management systems approach will better prepare us for any eventualities in the future. Mr. Sunil, please, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Najib. It was absolute a pleasure. Uh, first and foremost, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever we are. And my, you know, when I first connected with the Yelena, the thought came to me, life is all about meeting people and knowing people. I never knew that when I will meet Mr. Ahmed and Yelena in Baku, in United Nations Public Service Forum, and also Mr. John Mary, Chief of Public Administration in UNDESA, that we will connect again through virtual means. So thank you for the opportunity. The work which IAC KEFRA does, reaching out to many African nations is absolutely impressive and inspiring. So I feel deeply humbled and sincerely appreciate the leadership of CAFRED to give me the opportunity to share my thoughts actually with you on what is resilience on this uncertain time and management systems approach actually. I've been a management systems student, professional for the last 25 years. And I've learned a great deal from world leaders gurus like Dr. Deming, Dr. Juran, who are the architects of Japan's rise, economic rise to the power. So I'll share those thoughts with you and how this current business environment is impacting us. So how can public institutions and every other organization have these strategies and adopt standards to build or enhance the sustainability of their organization, build agility in their operations, build resilience in their organizations. Because as Dr. Mr. Najib said, this rude wake up call may not be the last one. In fact, a lot of people predict these crises. Mr. Bill Gates in his landmark TED talk in 2015 had spoken about it. And if you watch that TED talk today, we will think it was very recently recorded. So I'm gonna share some of my experiences and thoughts around strategies to build resilient organizations. You see, if you look back and ask yourself, you see, our mind is always looking for certainty. You know, a human being is designed to look for, we are craving for confirmation, precision, accuracy. We want to know the unknown, actually. 
but it's not so. So I'll just narrate a very beautiful example from Lady Eliza Buller. She was the Director General for MI5, the British Internal Secret Service. And her job was to predict and prevent terrorist attacks. Not an easy job. So she said that we will have some clues. We will have some dots. We would know something is cooking. Something is going to happen. But we will never ever know exactly what is going to happen, when and where and all that. So many times she said we would had to take decisions based on incomplete information. So that craving for certainty was they were dying to have that, they'll never have that. And they could uh, prevent about 12 out of the 15 attacks during her term. So she says it's a myth that you ever will have all the information you need. Whatever you do, when you make a decision, the knowledge and the wisdom is always incomplete. Now, reflecting back with COVID, what Mr. Najib said is it is so much of information we have been fed in the last 15 months, 18 months, right from restrictions to vaccinations to preventing to social distancing to regulations to travel to people getting stuck and uh, so much thing. Some of this severity of information has been for a long, long time. It's one and a half years and we have been absolutely exhausted. And still we are not out of it. So we gonna be living in this uncertainty a little longer and who knows what is in store for us next time. Let me come to resilience actually. You see, there are two kinds of resiliences. One is individual and one is organization. Individual is, you know, ability to bounce back. You know, suppose some we are hit with the pain, you know, somebody very close to us goes through very difficult times, like in COVID times, or somebody very close to us has an accident or unfortunately affected with cancer or a heart disease. Human being is and should become resilient actually. So when we bounce back, we say the guy is resilient actually. And he could deal with the unknown. He could adapt to that pain actually. So I reflect back in 1984-85. I don't know how many of people can relate to that world. We had no GPS. We had no internet, no Wi-Fi. That time, me and my friend, we traveled around the world on a motorcycle. We used to live in a very small industrial town of 400,000 people in India. We had only two telephones to the world from that whole city. And now we were planning to travel around the world on motorcycle. We didn't know what approval to take. We didn't know what kind of weather we'll experience when we cross borders, what immigration formalities will be there. If the bike breaks down, where are we going to get our spare parts? There were, we were not rich, you know, so we didn't have enough money. We were living on $10 a day, including fuel. If, uh, you know, we fall ill, who going to take care of us? So we had all the questions and uncertainties, and yet we did it. We did it out of my, our belief, our determination. And our best wishes are people and family and friends, the social support system. And the people, strangers we met on the way, they were extremely helpful. This is what we are experiencing even till today. So one is an individual resilience and other is corporations, organizations resilience. Now, some countries, including Oman, I mean, uh, you know, this public service program, which you and Dessa and led by Mr. John is encouraging, inspiring organizations to enhance governance, build systems to become robust, build ICT capabilities, build e-literacy. So on the other side, there are corporations and countries who had invested extensively to build 
capacities and they're very well prepared. If I may say, I live in United Arab Emirates, way back in very early 2000, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed launched the Dubai Internet City. Then we had ICT agenda. Then we had smart services. All that infrastructure helped the country try to manage COVID and come out of it successfully in a relatively shorter and faster period of time. In one of the branches, bank of HSBC was attacked. The building came down. Bank was up and running in 12 hours. They had a backup server somewhere further away in another country under the sea. So customers data accounts came back alive and kicking in 12 hours. So these are a lot of organizations around the world who were prepared for unforeseen challenges. So my message is it's doable. We can do that. Organizations, people have done it. And inshallah, we will move forward on that. Now, what is the organizational resilience? So, you know, this word is very common. It has come, is being used very often now in today's corporate world and everywhere else. So if I take Mr. Denver's 2017 definition is ability of an organization to anticipate, prepare, respond, and adapt to incremental change or sudden disruptions. If the organizations are used to incremental changes and minor disruptions and crises, which are short term in nature, not of this magnitude. You see, this crisis is about social, economic, environment, all aspects. All 7 billion people have been impacted in one way or the other for a long duration. So I thought this is a very, very appropriate definition to begin our session with. You know, we need to have systems to anticipate. What is going to go wrong? What kind of scenario planning we can have that? If you look at the wheel on the right side, it covers all leadership. Is role of leadership to anticipate. They need to have strategy in place to understand the context in which the business is operating, how nimble it should be, what risk it's experiencing. It needs to be prepared and manage those risks effectively. <coughs> and very difficult and most important is the culture and the behavior. I mean, uh, we saw the COVID-2 wave in India, a lot to do with behaviors. COVID-1, we thought we brought COVID under control from 100,000 to 9,000 infections a day. And when it hit, it hit us hard and brought 400,000 infections a day. And people say, actual maybe 2 million. So culture and behavior is also very critical if you want to create institutions with resilience. <clears throat> now there's another definition. I just want to bring your notice. There is the ISO standard 22316 released in year 2017 on building organization resilience. Really my strong recommendation is to look at these standards and inculcate and use it into the routine work. The, the causes and consequences of resilience are internal and external. Information leak internally, you know, we keep seeing all this cyber attacks, employees, it can be leaked through an employee, data theft. It impacts our ability to achieve our objectives or external factors. So it is a unique combination. You know, it's like a nuclear reaction, which then explodes actually. And due to the strategic and operational factors, the organization is impacted due to the uh, risks it, which it is exposed to. Now coming to the main focus of my talk is about strategies for building resilient organization. Is it based on my 20, 30 years of experience, focused on governance and uh, building robust institutions, I have bucketed them into four boxes. Focus on customer. You know why? Because organization exists to serve the customer. 
whether it is NGO or a public service or a government service or it is a private enterprise. No organization operates in a vacuum. So it operates in a business environment under a unique context. Same company, let's say Toyota operating in Africa has a different business context than operating in Europe and then operating in Japan. Then third is about people and culture, very critical. We may do best of the best thing. We may have good leaders and good management systems, but we need to change the way we behave and we act. And then is the bringing excellence in what we do and the way we do. Uh, these are, I'm not going to go through each, within each, there are uh, sub strategies. Uh, just mind you, you know, they're all interrelated. You know, external business environment, if it changes, it can affect customer needs. If customer needs change, then it can change the role of the people and it can change our processes and systems and structures. For example, you know, I was doing one study for a free zone authority here. So they may also make building. So suddenly regulations came from the government on construction related guidelines to build buildings or construction activity during COVID times. So it was an example of a change from coming from the external. And then the customer who was a customer of building his financial capacity was impacted. So he wanted to delay the building. He didn't have money anymore. Then supply chains got impacted. So we come here. So cement and steel and wood started getting expensive, not available. So an anxiety and fear in the people. So the whole thing is interconnected actually. Now I'll just pick up few, uh, so which have been personally very influenced. First, start with the customer. Why? That's why we exist. By and large, organizations exist to serve the customers. If you look at the government, it is G2C, G2B. So now it's time to go back and listen to your customers again. They have been impacted. Their needs have changed. They are going through total different business environment, right? So if you go to the school today, suppose I'm uh, serving an education system, whether are they working in hybrid or e-learning or classroom working? Now they have a different protocol for COVID to comply with. So I must go back to the customer and understand. Now there are many tools we can deploy. We have been using, we have customer focus groups, market research studies and things like that. But I, what I found something very unique, outstanding was the work done by Professor Clayton Christensen, a Harvard Business School professor. He is extremely well respected globally for his work on jobs to be done theory. And he was the one who developed the theory of disruptive innovation. And one of his finest book is How Will You Measure Your Life? It's a must read for anyone and everyone. How will you measure your life? Uh, it's very sad to say that he passed away at a very young age of 66 about last year, not due to COVID, due to other illness. So should you be interested, you may go back and listen to his TED talk and all that. So he says, try to understand why the customer wants a service from you. There is some need which has arisen in his life, customer's life. Suppose, you know, I moved to Montreal and I've got quickly to furnish my home. I may go to IKEA. So IKEA's products are functional, proven, tested, and within one day, I can furnish my house. Instead of going to 10 different outlets, to buy sofa, chair, table, lamp, and bed. So IKEA is designed to serve a need which rose in my life. It perfectly designed to serve that. So try to understand what problem the customer is trying to solve and how can I add value to them? 
how can I give him that customer experience? Now it's also true for government. Government cannot today say, here is a service, take it or leave it. Those days are gone. Customers are expecting good customer service and experience, transparency, integrity, and honesty, and speed from government also. So once you know what your customer needs, relook at your products and services, relook at your customer experience. Going to the second bullet, I've just taken one one piece. Sensing the external environment. You see, the organization operates in this. So there are regulatory requirements, there are suppliers and products, there's an opinion makers, environment, climate, macroeconomic factors, customer needs, competition. So, and then, you know, this organization is operating in this vibrant external environment, which is changing, even for the government. Now, based on all this, the leadership sets its vision, mission, objectives, strategies, and at the heart of the business are processes and procedures. And they consume technology, ERP systems, equipment, machine, and there is a people, organization, structure, and roles and responsibilities. So, today, organization must continuously keep a sense on it all. You know, I've been doing consulting work for 25, 30 years. Rarely I have seen a company having a list of regulators, list of strategic suppliers, who are, what are the environment concerns, what are the laws, regulations, uh, even well-defined customer needs are not clearly documented. Now, if a company does not know their stakeholders, they can never understand the external business need. So my strong recommendation is go back to the drawing board and clearly identify who are your stakeholders, what are their needs and expectations, and then build that into your business. Now, you need to have a dynamic system. Earlier, you know, I will come across companies, they'll do once in two, three years. That's not on anymore. We need to be very nimble, quick, adaptable, and do it more frequently. That's why I put here dynamic business environment. Processes. Now we need processes which are very agile, very quick. You know, this one company, you know, they wanted to buy these thermal scanners. You know, when anybody coming into the building, they will scan the temperatures just to check at the entrance whether he's got fever or not and is he infected with COVID and they take him aside. You know, earlier was prepare RFP, float a tender, put a procurement committee, tender opening committee, all that is gone, sir. They need to, while we spend money wisely, it's a government taxpayer's money, I'm talking of the government agency. They still need to procure these scanner thermometers quickly and place. So we need to have processes and people and mindsets and culture which has a sense of urgency. Coming another one very important thing, you know, we are used to traditional forecasting. You know, I worked in the government for uh, Abu Dhabi Digital Authority, Abu Dhabi Housing Authority, Dubai Ports Authority, and many other agencies. You know, we have a four year, three year, five year rolling plan. When year is over, we'll remove this column from Excel sheet, add another column in the right hand side and add, keep adding numbers plus minus here and there. That time is gone. Now imagine that this is, let's say November, December, 2021, and I have to make plan for 2022. There is so much of uncertainty, I cannot forecast. You know, this company, even after seven months into COVID, they were still monitoring the old KPIs. That time is gone, sir. You cannot rely on forecast. You see, earlier it was plan, sell, make profit, reinvest. Now I cannot plan. Even one week planning is difficult to travel somewhere. So we don't know. I'm planning and then suddenly there's a restriction. Sorry, all flights to that destination have stopped. Our customers are not buying. 
So the traditional forecasting is to be replaced with scenario planning. You see, this uh, beautiful, great work was done by Peter Schwartz from Shell Oil. You see, scenario planning started with military warfare. And he was the first one to use it extensively in oil and gas sector in 60s and 70s. And he said, what are the scenarios if suddenly oil supplies impacted or we have renewable energies or uh, the economic slowdown? So they visualized a lot of scenarios and then they picked a few which they thought can happen and they built alternate plans. Now, for example, uh, let's say oil and gas. Let's say I'm planning for 2022. Suppose the price of crude oil is $70. What are my plans? If the price shoots to 90, what are my plans? And if the price comes to 40, what are my plans? So businesses need to move on to the scenario planning and keep reviewing it rapidly along with forecasting. So this book is a good referral to look at. Now comes collaboration. You know, we live in a borderless world. Private sector has been at the top in collaboration. You know, if you look at, for example, a Toyota car, their wipers are coming from one country, fuel injection equipment from another country, chases from third country, tires from fifth country. The supply chains have been so perfected and they will have just in time equipment coming in, no inventory. If I may share with you, they were setting up a factory in US. You know, their focus was half a day of material for inventory. Compared to the companies in the government and all I've seen, you have months and months of material for inventory. Only four hours of inventory. Now, all this supply chain system, of course, has been impacted by the COVID and people are rethinking their supply chains. But now looking at the world is still going to collaborate on knowledge. You know, this vaccine development was a tremendous example of collaboration. You know, scientists, virologists, pharmacy companies, manufacturers, investors, microbiologists, scientists, test laboratory, all collaborated on real-time basis. The technology enabled that. I was reading somewhere, I think it is true, world took 100 years to build vaccine for polio. 100 years. This time we did it in one year. Imagine living in COVID without vaccine for even five years is impossible. So collaboration is going to be there for a long time. So I thought I'll build to the notice this is a beautiful standard 44001 on building long term strategic collaboration especially for the government sector you know we united nations un desa has been promoting ppp public private sector partnership but very little seen on the ground in reality still there is a bit of mistrust in the private sector that's not going to work for long and if you collaborate, you know, I had an opportunity to implement this framework for one government company and a bank. Bank was private. Ensure the objectives are very clearly aligned. You know, the government wanted to give service. This bank wanted to make profit out of it. So initially we had a lot of clashes on bank will not spend more open money on delivery channels. Customers were waiting for the service. We wanted them to open more retail outlets or internet banking service for these poor people. They wouldn't do that. They say, we don't have money. You know, any transaction, we get few cents. So alignment of strategic objectives is very critical. You know, if I share with you, Coca-Cola and McDonald's relationship goes back decades and decades. If McDonald's want to open 1,000 new outlets in India, Coke has to plan with it years in advance to put up the systems and manufacturing capability there. It's, you know, Firestone and Ford had 100 years of strategic partnership. Then a lot of time we have problem on communication protocol between the two 
stakeholders to companies and within roles responsibilities are not clear then kpis they have own kpis i have own kpis but we don't have shared common kpis and there's a beautiful standard i just picked up a couple of points from here now what the world is doing in this uncertain times this is a very recent study came out of deloitte they asked 2200 ceos implement processes that enable organization to redeploy workers in different roles you see there is a very big company here they are one of the largest and possibly the biggest uh, operators in retail you see when film industry came down when all their theaters and entertainment and parks were closed due to covid within 3 days they moved hundreds of people retrained them moved over to them on electronic service delivery channel so you need to have people who can be quickly mobilized rotational program 69% of the leaders said they are working on reskilling this green is they have done it before the covid and light green is they are planning to do in the next few years diverse who are revenue stream you know i have a customer they were manufacturing baggage tags for the airline you know they were supplying these baggage tags to 70 airlines in the world their tag will travel all over the world due to covid their business came down to almost zero factories were sitting idle people were idle so these days organizations not public institutions have to look at new ways of revenue stream provide flexible working hours supply chains so on and so forth yeah. coming to uh, almost to the last part of it is the management systems you know title of the talk is building sustainable systems using systems thinking you see we are champions we are good at fighting fires but that doesn't sustain the organization it is our structures roles kpis uh, management systems which will sustain and build resilience so just a theoretical part dr deming i'm sure a lot of you will know uh, contributed to the dramatic rise and turn around of japanese industry in 50s and 60s and 70s see is defined management system is a network or independent component that work together to achieve a common goal without going in detail human body is an outstanding example of a system working in seamless cohesive manner whether it is the breathing system digesting system or heart pumping system or eyes and everything kidney and all that similarly organization needs to clearly define their policies processes procedures and their interrelationships the many leaders think it's a procedure procedure you know give it to somebody else to look after it did we get as a 9000 yeah got it let's move on that's not on we are talking of the system suppose you click you buy something from amazon the moment you say click okay behind there's a flurry of systems happening the information goes to the third party vendor order is placed he starts packaging communication you get communication your order is in the packaging accounts goes then it goes to the banking then it goes to the transport company then it comes to the delivery guy it releases a flurry of triggers for different systems so similarly organization needs to put their systems in place and leadership should take ownership of that without systems you cannot have consistent delivery and cost is to the company is very high this is a reality you know this is how the work travels in a company back and forth employees are struggling and fighting with each other but why are we structured like this because we love silo working i love to keep my boss happy i don't care my internal customer or external customer these silos are these departments and this is where work is struggling to happen and we somehow deliver satisfaction 
Ideally, it should be a straight line and that too very nimble, quick and sharp. Just remember one, this quote from the whole talk, a bad system will beat a good person every time. We may have best of the best brains, committed people, but it is the struggle. And in government, you will hear this very often in every other meeting. It is with the tender, it is with the HR, it is with the budget, it is with that department, financial controller. That means the system is broken, actually. These are some of the standards you may look at whether it is quality management system, risk management, environment management, innovation, customer complaints, collaboration. You see, they are not like eight separate buckets. They are integrated and work in sync with each other. If we adopt this standard in true spirit, you can build a resilient organization. Last is about people. I read this book made in Japan. I was very impressed with the Japanese culture and their work methods. I had the opportunity to visit Yamaha Motor Company in Japan. Uh, and I'm very impressed still with them. So, you see, he writes in this book made in Japan. It's an outstanding autobiography. You see, he never got along with the chairman of the board. He was a deputy president. So one day chairman told him, Akai, I don't really like working with you. You're always different. You keep on challenging me and everybody else is in sync with me. Why do you have this uh, you know, problem actually? You know what he replied to him? He says, if both of us think alike, one, only one of us is doing it. He says, it is because we have different of opinion, difference of opinion. We reduce the risk of failure and we come out with a better, richer decision. So my message to here is, you know, we are used to yes men culture in the organization. It's the role of leadership to create a culture where it is okay to disagree with the boss and yet not be punished. And this was precisely the reason Lady Elinza was selected as Director General of MFI. She believed in critical feedback. She said, don't make me happy. Give me the facts. So these are some of the skills we need to develop in our people. Critical thinking, collaborative working, data analytics. You know, today, if you look at all the data is being created at all the touch points through ERP systems. Are we using that data? Very little. And how are we preventing the things that? Risk management, enterprise risk management is an integral part of the work today. Scanning environment, managing change, create is okay to be ambiguous and move on, actually, right? So these are the things I've taken a bit of it from Yuval Hariri's book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. Beautiful book. Last is speed. You know, we all have seen, you know, all this mobile COVID testing centers came up in few days. Vaccination deliveries came out in few days. China built a hospital in 10 days. So it is the ability to respond effectively and efficiently to the threats. Concluding thoughts, very well, Mr. Najib and others said is preparedness. Failing to prepare is no longer an option. It's not an excuse. Collaborate, flexibility our structures, policies, processes. We not only have to manage today's business, but we need to secure the future also. Is it today operational urgency and future are, you know, wine for leaders' time and space. Where should they put the budget for? Ensure people capabilities, innovation. So two things, more an organization is prepared for uncertainty, better it will be deal with it. 
and more resilient it will become. We can adopt the ISO standard on resilience. And also remember, crisis is also an opportunity to reinvent, transform ourselves. You know, I'm sure all of us are reflecting back on our own thinking, on our style, on our habits, how we are doing it. And out of it, we will emerge much more stronger and resilient and also grow. With this, I'm really very thankful to the leadership, Mr. Ahmed, Yelena, and Mr. Najeeb and others for the opportunity to share my experience. And I wish you all a wonderful day. Uh, thank you. And over to Mr. Najib for the question and answer session. <laughs> Mr. Sunil, I thank you very much for such an informative and educative uh, presentation. Uh, it was really wonderful and I learned a lot from it and I'm sure everybody did also. I just I wish you. that this presentation was done post COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Inshallah, we can do it again. Uh, really, I wish it was done post COVID. It would have changed uh, a lot of things today, I, I said. I like very much whenever in all your strategies, I see that you include culture and uh, behaviors. I think this is very important. A lot of people don't realize that, that when, when you manage, for, for example, myself, when I managed in Chad, I had to adapt the training, the management system and everything to Chad. And then when I moved to Kurdistan, I had to do the same thing again and mold it and change it into a way that it will suit the audiences. I, I like that very much. And I also like the word nimble you used. Thank you. You have to be nimble to switch and change and not be afraid and set in your own uh, comfort zone and stay there. And, and as you said, do last year's report or, or planning for next year. Just add a few figures and this, but the same copy, the same thing is done. Yeah. This is all nonsense and it should yeah. stop. Absolutely. We are facing a different world today. Yes. And uh, really, thank you very much for such a wonderful presentation. I, I really enjoyed it. And I hope everybody, I'm sure everybody else did. So if anybody has a, a question, you, can, you have a choice. You can either raise your hand and I will call on you and you can introduce yourself and ask the question directly to Mr. Sunil. Or you can write it down in the, in the place where it says you can chat so that I can uh, read it and Mr. Sunil will be ready to answer. Any questions, please? I'm sure we have some questions. It was such a wonderful presentation that we, we learned a lot from it and, you know, uh, I'll go first then, Mr. Sunil. I have okay. a question in my head. Again, Thanks, the sir. same thing. If this presentation or this, uh, this system was used before COVID, would this world today be a different world? Absolutely. If implemented in letter and spirit. Uh, you see, a lot of times we see organization have this system as a tick box mindset. It will not be true then. But if it is truly ingrained into the culture and systems of the organization, absolutely. You know, I see tremendous cost of poor quality in the way the COVID uh, situation is managed worldwide. Partly it was unpreparedness and partly it was very dynamic, but still it could have been managed very well. You know, one very good positive example is the tsunami. You know, when tsunami hit for the first time, lot of lives and material property was lost. But after that, uh, world leaders and uh, UN and government agencies put a lot of sensors under the sea and others to predict these things happening. And now tsunami is no longer that big a threat as it was before. So it is, uh, it would have definitely made a positive difference, I'm sure. Thank, Thank you for the question. 
Yelena Lager has a question. I will pass it on to her, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. It was very, very interesting and timely. Uh, my question is regarding forecasting and data. Because if we're talking about the way uh, governments can, can manage, let's say, the expectations of their uh, constituents, if we are talking about a context in which data is not readily available and perhaps you cannot entirely identify exactly or with, with some degree of, of, uh, of precision what, what your constituents actually look like, how would you propose to, um, to plan or to react in that case? Yeah, it's a, a very good question, Elena. It goes to the root of the whole thing. Uh, you see, there are multiple ways governments, public institutions, departments can engage with these constituents, whether it is citizen or a visitor or a, this thing. You see, it's not that, uh, you see, individuals in the government know, but organization doesn't know. Let me qualify this statement. You see, every day a customer is coming to the service center, if you take a physical word. Every day, customer is walking in or they're making a call. Let's say there's a call center. Thousands of interactions are happening every day with the health authority, with the municipality, with the pension fund, with the education council. Right. But that data, nobody is making sense of it all. It is treated as a transactional. And this data is not traveling to the leadership. You see, I'm reminded by the... 100 day turnaround plan put by President Bill Clinton and led by Vice President Al Gore in US 20 years back. You know what the first thing he did was listen to the customer and he and he made government leaders to go back to the route where customer is visiting and listen to them. Now we don't need big ERP systems to capture all the data, it will help. But even countries which do not have huge capital, we can still interact with the front end employees and try to understand what do they want. Believe me, you don't need surveys. If you just listen to the calls every day, 20 calls, you will know what customer is frustrated about, why they are unhappy about. You know, Southwest Airline CEO, sometimes he himself serves the in, in flight service. He wants to listen. There are many organizations, the leaders go to the customer to listen. If the front end employees sandwiched between policy procedures and structures and the customer, and nobody is listening to them. So, in my view, start with the customer and find very simple, easy ways to listen and connect and begin to put improvement program in place. And that's where mindset comes in. Customer is the king. We need to listen, accept however critical it is, and look to review our policies. Yeah. Uh, till we have you know, big systems in place. And I've also seen organizations having systems in place not being used. And you know, integrity of data is not easy. It is very tough because it's a question of behavior. The way I'm entering the data, you know, I've myself been affected at immigration. Uh, you know, suppose uh, my name is spelled incorrectly. You know, one of my close friend's father was blacklisted. He was not allowed to enter the country. When he went back to the CID and all, his father's name was wrongly spelled. One alphabet change and he was listed as blacklisted. So data will take a lot of time. We cannot do without data, but till we have that, listening to the customer through informal, formal, face-to-face -face channels, phone calls will help a lot. Thank you, Yelena. Yelena, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was very thorough and give me, gave me ulterior uh, food for thought. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions, please? 
Yes, so this is Nawal. Nawal, Nawal, Okay, Nawal, uh, please go ahead. Yes. Yeah, thank you for the informative uh, presentation. Uh, I want to relate this thing or uh, this topic to the change agent or ch change management. How we can relate this topic to those two topics, change agent and the change management. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a relevant question. I mean, uh, in my view, you know, just implementing, for example, these systems and standards and policies is beginning of a change process. You see, management systems thinking is trying to change the mindset of the people. You see, Dr. Deming used to say 94% of the challenges, problems are due to the common causes or are system related and only 6% are people related or due to the special cause factors. So once we leadership first needs to have a very clear vision for the change. Why are we changing? What do we want to change for? What are we going to achieve that? Now, change need not be too disruptive or too painful or too difficult. It can be done in a very calculated, smart manner, in a very transparent, honest manner. Now, we are, cannot delegate this change to few people who are known as change agents. Typically, organization will create a task force or a steering committee or make some change agents, slowly, slowly that dies actually. That's why I thought of systems thinking, systems approach. You see, adopting these standards will involve 100% of your employees in one way or the other. If we take people along, they'll accept the change. The path will come forward. And it will be easy and acceptable and sustainable change. So to do change, it depends what are we trying to change, but whether you are implementing ERP system, whether you want to uh, implement ISO standards, whether you want to adopt AI, whether you want to uh, prepare a succession plan, anything is a bit of change. And we need to find the stakeholders, listen to them, adopt their thoughts, and integrate into the change management process. And then only the change will be sustainable. And everything has to start with the leadership's true belief for the good to do and engage the principles of change here. Uh, it's a difficult and a large conversation. In short, these are my thoughts to share with you. Thank you. Nice, Thank you. Next question from uh, Dr. John Marie. Please go ahead, doctor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you for this uh, presentation. Uh, I, you have given me opportunity to refresh in my mind once again about some of the most teasing uh, management uh, Questions. Um, I, as I listen to you emphasizing the point of listening to the customer, uh, you went back and, and, and thought about leadership, which is uh, now a, a topic of my passion. And I have realized that probably of all competences in leadership, listening is the most critical. But when it is applied to government or public sector, uh, sometimes we need to appreciate the difficulties these government leaders go through when we are telling them to listen to the customer. Because then you turn around and say, which customer? If you take a country like Uganda, Customers are rich, some customers are poor, some customers 
don't like you. Some customers love you. Some customers. Yeah. So the, the listening has a, become the leadership challenge. Yeah. Just simply by saying, well, now of all these customers, who, who, which one should I listen to? And, and for whom, which one should I design an appropriate response? But the most critical thing is about in the context of government leadership, not private sector enterprises, it's about listening to the future. Yes. Because you see, when we think in terms of solving the problems of today, we lose the point in development. Development is not for today. Development is for the future. And then you've got these unborn customers. Yeah. They are born, they haven't developed the ability of expressing themselves. But as a leader focused on development for the future, you have to listen to those. Yes. That requires extraordinary ability to listen to the future and find the, the, the solutions to the problems that will come. Yeah. I don't think this is a question, it's just a comment which you have provoked in me as I kept on thinking. Thank you very much. Yeah. I mean, uh, I would like to just add on, I can't agree with you more. I had the opportunity to work for the government in India as well as here and interacted with a lot. It's very tough. But if we don't go back to the core principles of management or any framework, we will not be successful then. You know, the business starts with the customer, whether rich, poor, or angry, or happy, or uh, we will not be able to serve them in the right spread. So I totally agree with you, I understand, but we need to overcome this issue, whether it is power, whether it is politics, whether it is performance. One has to go by that. And that's what you all are trying to do in the world. Thank you, much appreciated, agreed. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Sunil, I think you're right. I think uh, when we talk about government, the customer is the people people what do the people want this is the customer okay it doesn't have to be a customer who wants to buy something or yeah. but the customer is the people yes. the people the, who elected the the, the the president or whoever yeah. exactly he should listen and, and see how to serve the people I yes. think. Yeah. Absolutely. thank you very much yeah. Yeah. any other questions i believe there's a question in the chat yeah. Sunil, sir, for clarifying the linkages between customer needs, external business environment, the process and procedure and culture of organization. Just a question in my mind. Why two good leaders behave differently in the same organization, though their goal is the same? This is from Nawal al Araimi. No, it's Rajiv, Mr. Rajiv from iPhone or something. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Rajiv. I mean, it's a very relevant and commonly seen thing. I mean, a lot of thoughts go in the mind when I read your, uh, when Mr. Najib read your question. You see, a lot has to do with leadership styles. You know, there are so many leadership styles. If you start going into the details, and leaders also become very adaptive when external business environment changes or the organization itself changes. Let me give you, for example, uh, Mr. Louis Jessner. You know, I am uh, his great fan. He was the CEO of IBM and he wrote the book, Elephants Can Also Dance. Uh, you see, IBM was huge. It was in hard frame, big frame business and was sinking. And when Howard Business School professor wrote that elephants cannot dance. I mean, they, she meant that it's about to die. Then Louis Jessner was brought in as CEO of IBM and he had nothing to do with computers. He was from Gillette actually. And when you read his autobiography, he learned a lot from the employees. 
and from customers. And then he adapted his leadership style. Same with Alan Mulally, who turned around Ford Motor Company. His you know, uh, recent autobiography is also very eye-opening. So then different uh, leaders will adapt to the needs of the stakeholders, customers, regulations, securing the future of the organization. It's a very dynamic thing. So there's no very clear answer why two leaders behave differently. There are a lot of factors playing on them. And of course, there are investors, dividend, you know, there's politics, <laughs> there's power game going on there. So not an easy question to answer, but I see your point. And these are some of the thoughts which cross my mind that it's dependent on the business environment and the current circumstances is, and of course, inter internal agenda also. Yeah. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you for attending from India. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? I did raise my hand. Mm -hmm. can, can, yes, can I want to ask a question? I did raise my hand. Balogun. Well, okay, I think, uh, okay, Nawal is asking another question, I think. He's... Ms. Nawal, can you please go ahead? Yes. Uh... Now, um, uh, for our customers, okay, uh, usually the customers, yani, their needs sometimes yani, uh, are dreams. 90% of the uh, customers, if they yani, yani, agree on uh, one thing for 90%, uh, we have to respond. So what, was, what is the strategy that we as a government can um, take to uh, respond to this uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, Yeah, very interesting question and uh, uh, very true. It's not only for the government, even in the private sector. You know, customers want everything free, easy, cheap, convenient, fast, and all that. You see, there are, a, it's a very serious and important question. My thoughts on this are essentially two. There's a difference between need and expectation. One is a fundam fundamental need, right? So I'll give you an example of a housing agency which was supporting poor people to have own house. So the organization's mandate and mission was provide affordable housing. Now, some of the customers wanted loans in millions. They want to make big villas. That's not the mandate of the organization. So underlying message is we need to set the expectations of the customer also right. We cannot be you know, overrun by customers' wishes and desires and wants and expectations. It has to be reasonable. So government or any company also has a role to put policies, processes uh, in place and also communicate it correctly, address the requirements correctly and set expectations right. You know, in one company I saw, one CEO was very customer focused. Every day he'll meet 10, 20 customers. But then he'll end up promising many things to them. And then the, the slips, yellow posted notes will keep coming down into the organization. He wants that, he wants that, she wants that. But employees were not able to deliver. Customers became more angry. We had complaints on complaints. But the message is we need to also be very candid, polite and firm and clear that this is why we exist and we are trying to address your needs, not your desires and wishes. So we need to make that very clear upfront, right? 
So uh, people say, you know, customer is king, but king can also be blind, you know. He should be not floating in the air. Yeah. I hope uh, I have addressed some of the things. And there's a beautiful framework, if you want, known as SERVQUAN. It was developed by Valerie Zethimel, Leonard Berry, and Parshuraman. SERVQUAN. You can look and read around that. That is where there's a lot goes into the how do we build expectation into the customer. Yeah. Thank you, Noam. Thank you very much, Mr. Sunil. Any more questions? Uh, I think we are running. Excuse me, may I intervene? We yes, have a question from Professor uh, Jeet Balogun, who was also the presenter last week. He did write uh, in the chat. Uh, let me just highlight that he was the special advisor of the 74th United Nations General Assembly Presidency. And he presented last week on meeting post-pandemic reconstruction and sustainable growth challenges, agency governance diagnostics possibilities, the video of which, if you haven't, if you didn't attend, you can find on the YouTube uh, channel of the IC CAFRED. Uh, Professor Balagun, would you like to ask your question? Well, <coughs> uh, just to uh, underscore the affinity between uh, the presentation of today and uh, last week. Of course, I can see that the emphasis today is uh, on uh, the ideal, like plans, strategies, uh, standards, things like that. Uh, but don't you also think that it is important to inter interrogate those factors and circumstances that might stand Professor, in the way of the realization of objectives? Did you get my question? Yes, sorry, sir, uh, I missed it. What is the last part? I mean, uh, I didn't listen to your last uh, session. So oh, if you don't uh, mind, okay, let me share let me that quickly. question. Yeah. Yes, let me quickly. Yeah, I, well, I started by say, uh, drawing a link between your presentation of today and mine of last week. And I said, your focus is on the ideas, is a plan, strategies, all those kind of things that may work easy, relatively easily in the private sector, but which uh, will face momentum, momentous challenges when transplanted uh, into uh, a, a government. Uh, so I am saying, don't you also think it is important that while talking about what is good in, in, in principle, uh, to, to look at those factors that might prevent you from realizing the objectives of collaboration, of, uh, I mean, all those kind of things which uh, you spoke about and which I agree with completely. The only thing is that we also need to, I mean, uh, uh, be, be very cautious in that assuming right. I think, that uh, what I happens when well, yeah. something is frozen here. Yeah. Uh, I I hear you. I get you. Okay, you, you got my yeah. question now. Yeah. You see, challenges, difficulties, frustrations definitely are there and they are more in the public sector or the government. I totally agree with you. Uh, and I have worked in both. But also let me share with you, even in private sector, there are very serious difficulties and challenges. Uh, you know, all these standards and strategies and approaches, you see, we are all trying to change the status quo of the current work, right? We are challenging and changing. And a lot of people don't like that. There's a comfort zone and they are okay to process the work the way they are doing it, but things are changing. So I have seen in UAE, Many, many government departments have adopted these standards and framework. Uh, just to give you an idea, His Highness has established Sheikh Khalifa Excellence Award Program, which is built on EFQM and now UAE fourth generation model. It's all about this. And every government department has to implement and be assessed every year. And it's going on for 20 years. So it is needed. And he also, uh, quite often I see tweets of His Highness 
expressing these difficulties and challenges that he says those who are not allowing people to work should really get out of the way i mean he himself is saying that at the highest level through tweet so and also i had opportunity to listen to the board member of toyota motor corporation executive vice president they had serious worker union related challenges in the plant in england very difficult same suzuki plant in india had serious problem it led to worker unrest and three four workers died in the clash so difficulties are everywhere and that's where leadership is needed actually so inshallah hopefully things will be better and we uh, sustain with our uh, effort with a constancy of purpose to succeed yeah thank you mr balagun any other questions then i should pass it back to uh, management thank you very much uh, any last comments from the speaker no nothing i really want to thank everyone for a very interactive engaging session and if i can be of service any help it should be my pleasure and honor and thank you once again iac kafrad for the opportunity and mr najib for excellent moderation thank you uh, mr bin suda do you have any last uh, comments well i see mr john murray has john's hand is there hand. you may have a question go ahead mr dr john yeah thank you very much it's no, it's not really a question uh, first of all uh, i think i think uh, um there was mention of uh, of uh, innovation as one of those things that can ensure resilience of organizations uh, and in this context of course uh, as you probably know i'm responsible for the united nations public service awards program which is a program through which uh, we promote innovations in public sector institutions and therefore I, i want to take this opportunity to emphasize that the resilience of any organization private or public really depends very much on uh, you know its ability to innovate uh, not just to, to to bounce back from a catastrophe but to bounce forward through innovation uh and uh, in that context i would want to take opportunity now to invite everyone uh, to join us on the 23rd of june to celebrate the united nations public service day uh, it is going to be a virtual celebration unfortunately because of covid as you know we always celebrate it uh, in a, in a big during a big forum now that is not going to happen so it will be virtual uh, mainly on un tv uh, so i hope uh, you will tune in we are going to have uh, a panel of very pr prominent people uh, discussing uh, aspects uh, of innovation in public sector institutions for survival uh, of uh, public service delivery Uh, sorry i have taken advantage to do some publicity but it is really good. <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you you want to say something mr sunil no i just want to thank you very much A pleasure this my thank you very much i will take the word back now i will take the opportunity to say that we have just posted the link to the uh, previously mentioned public service day celebrations on june 23rd which you are most welcome to join and i will now highlight the uh, event for next week So next week's seminar will be uh on the role of civil society in gov good governance and our speaker will be Mr. Osama Idris from the Netherlands 
And our moderator will be Mr. Logan Joseph Shaw from South Africa. Uh, the event will take place next Thursday at the same time, June 24th, and the language of the presentation will be English. I take the opportunity to thank all the attendees uh, for participating in today's event, and we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you.